Okay, hi there. My name is Dan Jones. I work at the British Antarctic Survey, and this is a web presentation on adjoint ocean modeling with MIT GCM and OpenAD. The intended audience for this presentation is anyone who maybe wants to run an ocean model using adjoint capability uh, for either sensitivity experiments or state estimation applications. I'm going to assume that, uh, that I'm going to start from a very basic level and I'll assume that um, <clears throat> that we have no familiarity with MIT GCM, ocean modeling, adjoint model development. So a lot of this talk will be very introductory. The second part of it will be a bit more technical and I'll describe how you would start to uh, implement an adjoint ocean model on Archer specifically. Okay, so MIT GCM, and that's the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology General Circulation Model. It's an open source numerical code that's used to study the ocean, atmosphere, and climate. You can use it to study the ocean by itself or the atmosphere by itself. Oceanography is a very common application for this code. Uh, so you can find a lot of papers and a lot of work where people have used this setup for um, ocean modeling. It has a lot of useful features. It comes with a lot of prepackaged verification experiments. So these verification ex exercises, as they're called, uh, are designed to work out of the box. You should be able to hopefully grab one of these verification exercises, compile it, and get it running on your local machine, hopefully without too much fuss. It has a non-hydrostatic mode, which means that it can handle a wider range of spatial scales for fluid dynamical modeling. Uh, a lot of large-scale ocean codes might have the hydrostatic assumption built into them uh, which means that you can't simulate convection in quite the same way that you can in non-hydrostatic mode. We'll be focusing on the adjoint modeling capability today. Uh, MIT GCM, since its early days, has been coded such that it's consistent with adjoint modeling methods. So it uh, has a long history of being integrated with adjoint modeling tools uh, for over a decade now. It also has a very active support community. This is a link to the support community, the mailing list. That also goes back over a decade. You can look at the archives and see how far back that goes. It's a searchable archive. This is an example of one of the things that has been done with MIT GCM. This is ECHO a product. Uh, ECHO is a model run that has been constrained by observations. So it's constrained by uh, ship track data, Argo float data, satellite data, and many other sources. So it produces a dynamically consistent representation of the ocean. And it's also consistent with the observations that we have. Yeah, so um, it's useful also, also for forward modeling, not just for adjoint modeling. So moving along, um, what is adjoint modeling, the subject of this talk? In a very general way, adjoint models are all about getting gradients, partial derivatives. How does some scalar function j depend on all of the possible inputs f? This plot is an example gradient field. This is the sensitivity of the North Atlantic surface heat content to atmospheric temperature. So you can see there are some places where it's more sensitive than others. This is really for illustration purposes only um, to show you that the sensitivity field itself can have variations in space and it's also variable in time. <clears throat> Gradients like this, they're useful for a lot of things including sensitivity experiments. That application is the focus of this talk so we're mostly going to talk about sensitivity experiments. You can also use adjoints 
to estimate the state of the ocean. I mentioned the ECHO project on the last slide. Uh, click here if you're interested, if you have the slides. Uh, you can click here or just do a Google search for the ECHO project using MIT GCM to see a long list of state estimates that have been generated using MIT GCM's adjoint modeling capability. But again, we're not going to focus too much on those. We're going to focus on sensitivity experiments, which I'll describe here. So I'm about to play this animation. What this is going to show you, the function that we're interested in is the heat transport across that black line there, the northward heat transport. These fields show you how that heat transport depends on the sea surface temperatures, both in space and in time. When I hit play, you'll see the sensitivity patterns propagating backwards in time. So you're looking further and further back in time and seeing uh, those locations and times that have the biggest impact on the heat transport across the black line. Let me play it now. I'll play that a couple of times. It's kind of fast. So what you see initially there, you see these red blobs of positive sensitivity wrapping around the coast of South America. So this is, just says that as you look further back in time, SST anomalies further and further away from that source can potentially impact, further and further away from the black line can impact the heat transport across that line. And the sensitivity decays away with time because at some point as you go far enough back, uh, the impacts get weaker. Here's another example. This is just a series of snapshots. In this case, the function that we're interested in is the value of the tracer. This is a tracer, a numerical tracer. At that location marked by a plus at the end of the simulation. So if you look back one year before the end of the simulation, you can see that places just upstream, this is South Africa here, places just upstream matter for that the uh, tracer concentration at that location, as do places connected by the Agulhas current to that. So both the Agulhas and the kind of upstream region matter for the tracer concentration there. As you look further back in time, the sensitivity patterns propagate further away from the source and they also get weaker with time. And that's a good example of a sensitivity experiment that shows you uh, all of those locations uh, that ultimately impact on the tracer value at that plus. I've got a few of these diagrams because I wanted to contrast what you do with traditional forward perturbation experiments with what you do with adjoint models. So let's say that you're interested in how the wind stress impacts something like sea surface temperature or sea surface height. So what you would do, I've labeled, uh, oh, sorry. I've labeled distance on this axis and time on this axis. So you would pick some location and time in a traditional forward perturbation experiment, and you would give it a little kick. You would increase or decrease the value in some chosen fashion to represent perturbation, that location and time. And then you would examine the outputs. For example, you would examine sea surface height you would see anomalies propagating away from that perturbation region, from the source region where you kicked the model. They would propagate away over some distance. And the slope of that line represents the speed of that propagating influence. You would then need to look at another output and see its effect propagating in space and time. So this is fine. But one of the limitations is that um, if you wanted to get a complete characterization of how the wind stress field everywhere affects, say, the sea surface height, you would have to run a very, very large number of individual perturbation experiments. 
So it becomes very computationally expensive to run a large suite of forward perturbation experiments. The adjoint model offers you an alternative. And what you do in this alternative framework is you kind of go the other way. You pick an output, some variable you're interested in, like sea surface temperature. Let's say you pick that location and that time. The adjoint model, in a sense, perturbs this. And then you can watch the influence propagating backwards in time and over some distance. And the nice thing is that you could you get a complete list of how the sea surface temperature depends on all the possible inputs. So you can see how the sea surface temperature depends on wind stress at different locations and times. And you can see how the sea surface temperature depends on air temperature at all locations and times. Just for example, in reality, there would be a very large collection of inputs in a full simulation. You would have you know, potentially all of the atmospheric forcing variables. What you get as a result is a collection of gradients. The gradients that I mentioned, uh, that, that's what we're after. So how does the sea surface temperature depend on wind stress? How does the sea surface temperature depend on the air temperature? That sort of thing. Okay, moving on. Another slightly different way to think about adjoint modeling, and I'm just trying to offer several different perspectives that overlap a little bit here so that hopefully you'll get a better sense of what adjoint mod modeling is. You can think of your model as an operator that acts on some set of inputs, f. So f is a vector of inputs, which could include uh, wind stress, for example, at all different locations and times, sea surface, uh, sorry, not sea surface, but uh, air temperature, air humidity, if you're running an ocean-only model. You then get some output. You've got input, the model acts as an operator to give you output. When you talk about adjoint modeling, you'll hear people talk about the objective function. It's sometimes called the cost function because adjoint models are often used to constrain a numerical model run to the data that we have available to the observations. And in those situations, a cost function penalizes a model for being too far away from the observations. Uh, in our case, it would be a, a little bit misleading to call it a cost function, but uh, because we're not penalizing anything in this case, we're just interested in the sensitivities to some physical quantities. But nevertheless, you will hear people uh, use the term cost function uh, when they're talking about the objective function. And even later in this talk, I'll mention that the MIT GCM package that handles this function is called cost. So that's just some terminology to get used to when you're thinking about this approach. Again, adjoint models give you these gradients. How does the cost function or objective function J depend on all the different inputs F at locations X prime and times T prime? representing all the available space and times in the past. One question that comes up from time to time, uh, I've been asked if adjoint models are just correlating things. And the answer is no, they're not just correlations. The sensitivities, that is the gradients that you get out of adjoints, uh, show you real physical relationships. Let me proceed with this example here. Let's say you've got a model, a setup, where process A drives two other processes. Um, let's not worry too much about what they would be. We can just be mathematicians for a minute and let everything be very generalized. So process A drives process B and process C. And if you look at processes B and C, uh, well, they look very similar. Their covariance is almost one. They're doing nearly the same thing. 
But in this contrived example, B and C are not physically related. They just happen to change together in the same way. So they're correlated, but they're not causally connected. The nice thing about an adjoint model, an adjoint model in this example would show you the real physical connections. So let's let the objective function be some value of this field B, some function of B, it could be. The adjoint model will correctly tell you that the sensitivity of B to process C is zero. B doesn't depend on C, but B does depend on A. So the dependence of B on A is non-zero. That gradient is non-zero. So a simple correlation would tell you that B and C are connected somehow, but the adjoint model shows you the real physical relationship that, no, B only depends on A in this case. So that's very helpful if you're trying to decouple uh, things that happen to be correlated from things that really are causally connected to each other. The caveat is that this is only as good, uh, the gradients are only as good as the model because all of the gradients come from the model. Uh, so if your model isn't a good representation of the physical system, the, this could still be misleading. Then the gradients you get will be misleading. So that's a, a good thing to keep in mind. Hopefully by now I've given you a decent sense for what an adjoint model can do and what an adjoint sensitivity experiment looks like. So from here on out, the talk is going to get a bit more technical. Uh, I'm going to describe in very broad terms how you might make your own experiment using MIT GCM and OpenAD. So there are links at the end of this talk to the technical report for this ECSE project, which uh, that report has a lot more detail in it about how to make your own experiments uh, from the ones that, that we have used. And you can also read more uh, of the MIT DCM documentation for a better description of what to do. There's also finally the support list, which is usually helpful for getting MIT DCM to actually work. Uh, for a specific experiment. So here are the broad steps that you would need to follow. First, you want to download and install MIT GCM on Archer. You'll also need to download and install OpenAD on Archer. There is a commercial option for step two. Um, you can buy an, a license from FastOpt uh, for an algorithmic differentiation tool, something that can turn your model into an adjoint model. Uh, so that is an option, but OpenAD is uh, free and open source. So there, uh, it has that advantage to it. And step three, you want to modify one of the test cases. You don't have to, it's just, uh, that's an easy way to start. As you start from something that already works, turn some knobs and change it into what you want, uh, and then, then run that experiment. In the MIT GCM language, this is called uh, verification exercises. And when you download the MIT GCM source code, you'll see them. They're in a folder with that name, verification. Finally, you'll want to compile and run the model. And hopefully, you'll get some nice results. Oops, sorry. You'll get some nice results at the end. So, MIT GCM is not centrally installed or maintained on Archer. It's not included in the packages of, uh, of Archer. Um, it's something that you'll need to download yourself. You can get the source code from that link below there. Uh, you can use CVS, for example, to check out the source code. That can be a good way to proceed because then you can get uh, more recent updates as the updates come out. And some of the adjoint modeling tools, uh, especially as related to OpenAD, uh, do change kind of rapidly. Uh, they are 
always in development and they're undergoing rapid development. So there, there can be some advantages to staying up to date with the most recent version of the code. Uh, of course, the other danger there is, uh, let's say you get something working and then you update your source code and suddenly things don't work anymore. That can happen, that's the danger. So you have to decide on the right balance for you between keeping up to date with the source code and sticking with a checkpoint of the code that works for you. On Archer, this is an Archer specific comment. Uh, remember that the home file system is backed up and your work file system is not. So um, one suggestion is that you may want to compile your model on the home file system so that the, your source code modifications are backed up uh, and then you'll want to run the model on the work file system. You can't run it from the home file system, so you'll have to run it on work. The disadvantage there is that does involve transferring your code tree from the home file system to the work file system every time you compile, which maybe isn't ideal. Uh, but the advantage there is that you have a backed up copy of your code uh, on Archer. You can always keep your own backup, of course, and then that's fine. <laughs> then you can do that uh, as you please. One good verification exercise to try is tutorial tracer adjsense, adjoint sensitivity. That example is relevant to what we are going to be talking about today um, for the rest of this talk. One of the outputs of this ECSE project is a build options file. MIT GCM, in order to do its job and compile, needs to know things like where the libraries are and uh, various compile time options. Uh, this ECSE, thanks to uh, Gavin Pringle at EPCC and David Ferreira at Reading, uh, it's produced a Cray, op Cray build environment options file for Archer that's been optimized uh, just for Archer. It's maintained by David Ferreira at Reading, and it's checked every night and automated testing. It now comes with the source code. So when you download MIT GCM in that location, in the tools folder, build options, you will see this file. It's Linux underscore IA64. And that should work fine for Archer. One error you may run into if you're building a big model, you might get an error with the phrase relocation truncated to fit and that's a, a memory issue. So what I've found, uh, what I've found is that if I go to the build options file and uncomment these two lines, or include these flags in some other way, uh, I can get rid of this relocation truncated to fit error. So that's just a good thing to try out if you run into that on Archer. We do have build options files for the Intel and GNU environments, but they're not tested and not maintained. Uh, they, well, they've been tested, but what I mean is they're not continuously tested in the way that the Cray one is. A few more technical notes. I just wanted to show you what the script looks like to compile in my TGCM on Archer, or uh, I say the script, I mean a script. You'll need something that points to the root of your MIT GCM installation, wherever you chose that to be. So, for example, this environment variable here in Bash points to the root of my MIT GCM installation. This points to the options file, the build options file that I mentioned on the last slide. Um, MIT GCM should work fine with the default modules as of today. It still seems to be working fine for, for me. Uh, using the default modules. The only thing is that if you want to use NetCDF, you'll need to load these two modules in Archer, uh, you know, at the command line in order to get access to those libraries. You run a genmake2 command that makes the make file. MPI, if you, you only need that flag if you are running a multi-core version using more than one core. The mods flag has to point to the source code modifications, and OF, the OF flag points to the options file. 
you run make depend and make, and hopefully at the end you will have an executable. Starts with the letters MIT <coughs> that you can then run. This is not the adjoint case. The adjoint case looks a little bit different, and we'll talk about how to generate that case now. Okay, so I mentioned OpenAD in passing. Let me tell you a bit about what it is. Uh, so OpenAD is an algorithmic differentiation tool. It takes your MIT GCM source code and using directives that have been placed in the MIT GCM source code, it creates adjoint model source code from your source code. So it's um, sometimes people call it a source to source translator because it takes one set of source code and turns it into another set of source code that you can then compile. It has several different components and uh, it's been developed largely by uh, Patrick Heimbach and others, Patrick Heimbach um, at MIT and also at UT Austin. You can get the source code here and the site has instructions on how to install it. Uh, I just keep mine in my home directory on Archer is where mine lives. So it's all backed up and uh, it's easy to point to when I'm compiling. Again, note that OpenAD is under active development. Uh, there are some limitations. The calendar package and external forcing packages are not yet supported, for example. Uh, but this is changing all the time. There's a development team working on it um, as, as they are able to. So new packages are being added all the time. Uh, I mention this because uh, you there are elements of it that may not work just out of the box. You may have to uh, work with the developers or work with myself a little bit uh, to get your application going. Uh, so you, you, should, you should expect a little fussiness uh, at this stage, trying to get something to work. The verification exercises should, should just work. Those should be fine. So getting a verification exercise shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be a problem. But doing anything beyond that uh, just be prepared for uh, a little bit of, of development work there. I'd like to mention some of the MIT GCM packages that you need for uh, doing adjoint work. Here are four of them. The auto diff package is a broad support package for this process of algorithmic differentiation. That is of turning your MIT GCM source code into um, adjoint model source code. It also handles the active files, which um, adjoint models tend to, at least the ones generated by OpenAD and TAF, the commercial option, they tend to do a lot of reading and writing uh, to these individual files uh, as a way, as an alternative to simply keeping everything in memory. Uh, so some of that's handled through autodiff. You probably won't have to touch much in the autodiff package. Uh, you, you might, but for a uh, basic application, you shouldn't have to do much with it. You will probably need to do a bit with the cost function package. Uh, the cost package is where you define the objective function. So there are lots of pre-existing cost functions that you can select from using different directives. Um, for example, the heat transport across 26 North. But to get a specific cost function for your application, you may need to do some coding. <coughs> Excuse me. You may need to do some, um, some coding and some model development work to get your specific cost function to work. At present, a lot of the cost function stuff is defined at compile time. Uh, there are some new features that have come online recently. Uh, the gen cost package, the gen cost aspect of the um, echo package that can allow you to define uh, bits of the cost function at runtime, but uh, in simpler applications, uh, well, I say simpler, but in, in many applications, the cost function is defined at runtime. Control, uh, if you're using control variables, they're defined here. Um, 
this is more relevant for state estimation problems than it is for um, for adjoint sensitivity experiments. The last one on the list, the gradient check package, this is useful. This ensures, uh, well, I say ensures, it checks to make sure that the adjoint gradients agree with the finite difference gradients. Adjoint models are linearizations about a basic state. So if you find yourself in a highly nonlinear regime, the finite difference gradients can end up looking quite different from the adjoint gradients. So using grad check uh, is a way to make sure that your, your model is still in a linear enough regime for the adjoint approach to be useful. So it's a very useful tool. Uh, it obviously doesn't calculate every single gradient. Uh, you have to give it some parameters to tell it which gradients to calculate. Uh, because, well, it would be too computationally expensive to do every single forward perturbation. So you really just uh, pick a few to check to make sure the gradients are reasonable. When you're compiling with OpenAD, there are a couple of tricks. This is, uh, <coughs> this is what needs to be different in your compilation procedure uh, if you're using OpenAD. So first, we found that you'll need to manually edit the path in this fashion, the LD library path. Um, uh, we verif verified this with the Archer support team as of early 2016 anyway. You, this is something that you have to do to get OpenAD to work. Um, uh, I think it's because some things are kind of hard-coded into OpenAD when you compile it, when you compile the OpenAD tool itself. So you have to uh, have this explicit path in here as a result. When you're running OpenAD, you have to set the environment variables. But there is a script for that in the OpenAD folder, the setInv script. The genmake2 command, the command to genmake2, you need this OAD flag to indicate that you want to use OpenAD, and the mods Needs, the mods flag needs to point to the code OAD folder. Finally, the command changes from make depend make to just make add all. And that will start the construction of your adjoint model. That, that build process with OpenAD uh, is slower than uh, the forward build process. It's much slower. So you'll need to allow for a lot more time for that to happen. Uh, for that compilation process to occur. Let's talk more about this uh, adjoint test case, the sensitivity experiment. This is one of the verification exercises. It's found in this folder in the MIT GCM directory, verification tutorial tracer edge sense. It's a global model, four degree horizontal resolution, and it solves this tracer advection equation. So this tracer advection equation says that the rate of change of the tracer C at every grid cell depends on the flux, and it depends on this time scale. This, is an, this represents an outgassing process. It's a parameterization of an outgassing process. It also depends on vertical mixing and on a source S. The objective function in this case is the total outgassing from the ocean from time zero to time t. So this is the total outgassing of this carbon tracer from the ocean into the atmosphere. When you look in the source code, you'll see that this is defined as a sum over the volume and over time of this tendency, of this uh, parameter mu and the tracer C. This experiment is uh, derived from a model set up used by Hill and others, this paper from 2004. So I'd recommend reading that paper first before experimenting with the verification exercise so you get a sense of what this setup can do. You'll find a bunch of directories in the test case, and I just wanted to 
give you a quick indication of what these are. You'll see a couple build directories. That's typically where you compile the model. This is where you create your executable. You would run your compilation scripts from these directories, for example. Um, whoops, build is usually where you put your forward model, the non adjoint model. And build ID is where you would find, where you would compile the adjoint model. You want to create uh, a build OAD directory because there isn't one already in that setup, even though there is a code OAD. Code, this is where you contain, this is where the source code modifications are located. This is how MIT GCM works. Uh, you've got the source code, and anything that you want to change about the source code for your experiment, you put it in the code folder. Then when you run the genmake command, you point genmake to that code folder so it knows to use the source code modifications in that directory. So you would set things like the domain decomposition, how many cores you want to use. You would set that at compile time. You'd set aspects of the cost function at compile time. The input directories, they, they contain input that are suitable for the forward case, excuse me, the adjoint case and the open AD adjoint case. So this includes things like the surface forcing, the atmospheric temperatures, um, the number of time steps, the size of each time step, the length of each time step rather, the runtime parameters. So they've all been set up appropriately for uh, those three cases, the forward and the two, the adjoint ones that use different tools. In the results directory, if you get this from our project, from ECSE, uh, our, our ECSE, um, then you'll see some standard output, including some for Archer. So you can compare the standard output that you get with the standard of output that we received when, when we ran these test cases for Archer. And you'll see an empty run directory. Um, if you like, you can make a run underscore OAD for your OpenID experiment. The, one of the output files you get is the standard out file. Standard out. The adjoint gradient. Um, you can do a grep for the term adjoint gradient in the standard out file and see what the adjoint gradient looks like at a location specified in data.grad check. This is to make sure that the gradients agree. Then you can also do a grep for this phrase, finite diff grad standard out in the standard out file, that is, to get the finite difference gradients. Then you can compare them, this top line to that top line, and you can see that they agree reasonably well to a few decimal places um, in this particular experiment. So depending on the level of accuracy that you need, you can evaluate the accuracy of the, sorry, you can evaluate the accuracy of the adjoint gradient relative to the finite difference gradient. Again, the adjoint gradients are, are exact, but they're only going to be valid if the linear approximation uh, is a good one in the parameter regime that you find yourself in. But it's important to do this check to uh, make sure that you're in that linear regime. Wrapping up here, I'd like to say thanks to a long list of people, Gavin Pringle at EPCC, uh, he did a ton of the work on this ECSC project um, and did a lot of writing for the website and for the technical report as well. Chris Johnson, Terry Sloan, and others at EPCC. Uh, Sudipta Goswami at the British Antarctic Survey. He helped a lot with the uh, adjoint model setups. David Friera at Reading. Uh, he's done a lot with the build options file that I mentioned earlier and also Dan Goldberg at Edinburgh. Paul Holland here at Bass. And a big thanks also to Patrick Heimbach at MIT and UT Austin for his support and for uh, Krishna Narayanan for, from Argonne 
he provided a lot of open AD support as well. And uh, there are more, let's see. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, there's a lot that uh, came out of this ECSC that I didn't mention in this talk for the sake of, of time. Um, you can read our technical report to get more information about this. Um, there are new OpenID applications for glaciology that Dan Goldberg uh, worked on with Gavin uh, and with uh, Krishna Narayanan. Uh, so that was one of the outputs here. Uh, Krishna Narayanan also created an implementation of Diva for OpenID. And this is important for Archer because it enables restarts on Archer. Uh, if you don't use Diva, then you have to finish your entire adjoint run uh, in whatever the queue time that you have, uh, not queue time, sorry, but in whatever run time you have available. On Archer, unless you ask for a reservation, this is a maximum of 48 hours, which sometimes just isn't enough to a complete a mobile run. So uh, Diva allows you to start, to stop and restart your adjoint model, uh, which is very important if you're working with a uh, queue time that is short relative to the length of your model run. We also produced two forward test cases for Archer and two adjoint test cases that have been modified a bit for Archer. They're based on pre-existing MIT GCM uh, verification experiments, just uh, slightly changed a bit here and there and tested for Archer to make sure that everything works. So finally, here's a link to our project website, or you can go directly to the technical report available here, um, which contains a lot more information uh, about how to use our test cases and how to get an adjoint model set up on Archer. I'm also happy to answer any questions that you have or to try to give you some assistance on setting things up. Uh, you can reach me by email there. So um, good, I hope I've given you a, a good sense of what adjoint modeling can do and how you could implement this uh, for yourself on Archer. Um, so uh, thank you. That's all from me. That's excellent, thanks Dan, that was, that was great. Um, I noticed uh, during the, your talk that we uh, our, our participant joined us with the name JJ Hash Two. I was just wondering if, if JJ had any questions. Uh, JJ, you can either ask. Um, oh, hello. You can either ask by a chat or uh, use the microphone if you wish. But. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, so I, I actually um, I managed to join uh, a bit late into that one. I think I uh, yeah <laughs> I think I noted down the time wrong. So apologies for that. Um, so uh, yeah, basically um, I wasn't entirely sure what uh, adjoint ocean modeling was before um, joining in to the um, to the uh, presentation. Um, it's I, I'm just involved with some projects which uh, are concerned with sort of modeling sort of ocean um, uh, ocean conditions and things like maritime conditions um, in the interest of maritime safety and oh. uh, kind of optimizing those for um, high performance computing and things. Um, so. I I got I got like I got half of the presentation, but I, I have a feeling that some of my questions would be like, "What was the first half?" So I guess uh, what's the um, will there be a chance to download the slides and things? And I might just take your email address and ask any questions about it afterwards. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. We're providing both the recording and um, and the slides. Um, sorry, I was hearing a little bit of feedback on my end, but yeah, we're we're going to provide both the recording of the talk and the slides. And I'm, I'm totally happy to answer any questions you have over email or, or Skype or uh, you know, a phone chat. Um, so yeah, please feel free. OK, nice. Well, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Good, I'm glad you liked it. Thanks for, for coming along. Yeah, no problem. So um, 
I didn't hear you say, I'll, I'll email you and ask where the slides are and things. It would be easier that way. Um, so uh, okay. thanks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass them on to the EPCC folks uh, right now. So I think they'll get them up you know, tomorrow or the next day. Yes. But there'll be an answer soon on uh, all Archer's mailing on the user list to let them know that when the, the, the movie of the talk is available in the slides, et cetera. OK, cool. But, uh, feel free to email me, and I can just I can also send them to you directly if you like. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. That was terrific. Um, I think that ends our ECSE project. I guess it does. <laughs>